as you cultivate yourself, what you want to do is to try to weed out whatever habits you have. Have the discipline to not do the things that you are not supposed to do. And then try to become better, to be the better half of who you can be. So start with yourself first. And now if we expand that out to, uh, to, your, to your spouse or your significant other, then what you have is, you have, uh, when you are in a, a relationship, you want to create and enable an environment that allows the other person to be the better half of who they are. If, you're, uh, if your wife says to you something, you don't root for the things to criticize, to put them down, to make them feel like the lower half of who they are. You try to lift them up. You try to make them be the best part of who they can be. And so you want to nurture an environment with your, with your spouse. First of all, is that everybody can feel better about themselves. And for me, on a day-to-day -day basis, the acid test for me is whenever I enter a room and I leave the room, have I left the room worse off than when I came in? Have I left the room where people feel bad about themselves? Or have I helped to uplift? I mean, there's certain people I know when they come in the room, they're like, oh, damn. And it's waiting for the person to leave, right? But there are other people, when they walk in the room, everybody starts to smile, right? So that's what I'm talking about. Everybody has a propensity to make a difference to everybody else around them. So. If we take that now and expand it, not only to your spouse, but then to your family, your parents, your kids, and let's expand it even more to your, your co-workers. When you walk in, I mean, I know that as consultants we are judged every day with our performance, but if you then put other people down so you can look better, at the end of the day, it really doesn't make a difference for what, in terms of who wins that one. But it makes a difference in how you touch other people and how you help them. So what I'm saying is that relationships is the most important. And when you apply this concept first to yourself about being the better half of who you can be, and then apply that not only to your spouse, but then to all the people around you, and even to the universe. You know, we don't take care of the universe like we should. We are not in touch with nature like right? But you apply the same concept. You know, as my wife would say, is, you know, are we consumers or producers? She always telling my kids, you know, are you a consumer or a producer? So you don't just take things, you also give back. So that's what we talked about, cultivating through relationships. And at the highest level of this cultivation, then there is no separateness anymore. Because then you're actually acting out of unity and recognizing that we are all from the same source. And if we all act in unity, and there is no separation, and we all try to advance everybody else in the universe. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so, okay, so having said that, then what I want to do is to open it up so we can talk about how we can apply this concept, the concept of enabling people to be the better half of who they can be. To, you know, this world is a stage. We all have to exist here through relationships. But now I want to, to open it up for a specific example of challenges that you have in relationships. And then we can talk about how to apply the cultivation concepts to real world. So, um, anyone have any questions? Anything, questions about what I've said or from your presentation, it seems that uh, uh, money mm -hmm. can sometimes get in the way of relationship. Mm -hmm. But we also know at the same time that in some, you know, couple, for example, or family where there's no money, uh, life can be <coughs> devastating and relationship can be damaged. Mm -hmm. So what is... Answer your question, but I also want to point this out is... In this room, our existence relative to people in Haiti, Jamaica, or some places that we come from, that's not our stage. The stage that we are on, we, everybody in this room, is very fortunate. 
So when we talk about extreme cases, and I'm going to get to it, is that's not our existence. Our problem is that, yes, if you have no money, it's really hard to be happy. But having money doesn't result in happiness. No. So for us, I know, I can speak for myself, coming from Jamaica, I'm coming from third world country where I had my brothers hand me down shoes and I walked two miles to get to school and use the water to wash my feet to put on my shoes because I'm saved for my next brother. That's not where I live today, right? And that is, that is something that a lot of people in the world are struggling with. But for us, our struggle is that enough is never enough. There's always one more. And when is enough enough? And because we focus on our goal and our cars, our house, then we are never satisfied. We actually cause more suffering to ourselves because of the choices that we make. That is the stage that we are on. And that is our challenge. Our challenge is not going to be that, oh, you know, I have no house and a mudslide. That's not our, that's not the stage we're at. So when we talk about cultivating for us, our challenges are a little different. We have to say, do I have enough? And if not enough, what is enough? There's always one more. And so we have to simplify our lives. We have to say, do I really need that car? Because along with that car, it comes with maintenance. Do I really need whatever X is? Is that going to make me more happy? Is that just really a result of my ego, my pride, my desires? Okay. And when we use this type of system, when we look at the cheat sheet, and then we say, I'm here, am I trying to yearn for something because of one of my um, human desires? And you say, what is the cost? What's the cost of my inner happiness? And as, you get, as I get older, I realize that simplifying my life it's much better for my inner harmony because a hundred years from now, I, nobody's going to remember that stuff. Right? So having said that, I'm going to come back to you. So I believe that you've seen, you've heard like people in a concentration camp. And when they're in a concentration camp, on a day-to-day -day basis, they're actually literally in hell. But even then, for those people, if they believe in something beyond just themselves, if they realize that there's something that is more than just this life, if they can keep that in mind and realize that this is impermanent, this too will pass, then they are easier to accept the suffering they're going through, knowing that this is not all, this is just a stage. Right? Now, there's two levels of suffering. Is one is when you're actually going through the situation. Right? And when you're going through that situation, it is suffering. But then there's a second level of suffering is, is, is in your mind, your mental. How you react to that suffering. So people, yes, when somebody cut me, I do feel the pain and I suffer. But if I keep recollecting the pain and I don't get beyond it and I become attached to the pain, then what happens is now my mind starts wrapping around the pain. And then every day, all I think about is the pain. And then my whole life becomes a secondary suffering, which is even after the, there is no pain or I've taken something to ease the pain, I still feel suffering in my mind because my mind won't let go of it. Right? So this is, no matter what situation you're in, you have to also look at not just the physical pain, but the mental. And you can't control most of the time what happened to you. You can be going about your business, and just out of the blue something happens to you and you go, why me? You don't control that. React to it. The secondary suffering. 